Ira Wolf, it's great to have you on this special episode of Dig Life Deep. Our listeners know you from your weekly segment on this show, Future Shock 2.0. So we're having you back for this extended episode, a kind of an extended Future Shock 2.0 to talk about the surveillance economy. Um, since the pandemic, the reports are that big companies, small companies, median companies have ratcheted up their surveillance technology. They're watching every movement by employees. Not that they weren't doing that in the past, but they're apparently doing it much more intensively, monitoring their emails, um, what they're doing at the office when they arrive at the office, when they're working remotely from home. I guess my first question for you is, has this gone too far? John, that's a great question. And as you know, with that introduction, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, you nailed it. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, not through technology, um, but time cards. It was like, when did you check in? When didn't you check in? And then for a while, people would have would arrive late and have somebody else check in. So then they had cameras around, you know, the the time the the time machine. So uh, that's been going on for a long time. And certainly there's been, as long as I've been in business, or at least the last 25 years or so, I'd say, uh, productivity. I mean, measure your steps. How long did it take you to answer the phone call? Call centers were notorious for this. Uh, what were you doing? Uh, and and in order to pr improve productivity, and, and every organization, whether you're profit or nonprofit, needs, everybody needs to pay the bills. <laughs> Everybody needs to, to to keep the lights on. And whether you're profit or nonprofit, at the end of the day, you either need money to give away to other people or you need money to make a profit and satisfy the shareholders and, and live. So it, it, one way to improve productivity, individual productivity, make sure the best people are working and you're not you're not just being busy, is to measure things. Okay. But the real issue is as you hear that is then it becomes is really a trust issue it's really about trust because if you're moder now with if you're monitoring me you're tracking my keystrokes you're looking at my eye movements is how much screen time do i have uh how long did i spend on that call what am i doing if if you're tracking if you're tracking that and i don't know why you're doing it or i think you can use it against me and there's no value for me as an employee, then yeah, I'm going to push back. I'm going to resist. Uh, and and so I, I think that's where we are. I, I think we we you know is it bad that companies are doing it? Do employees say, hey, don't you trust me? I'm trying the best I can. That's an age old problem. That's going to go on forever. Um, it's got a lot more complicated with technology now. Um, but do companies have a right? Do employers have a right to? to find more productive ways. And if it's used correctly, that's going to benefit the employee. If I knew that, hey, you know what we found out? That 62% of the time we spend in meetings is not effective. So we're not going to do that anymore. And if you told company, if you went in with that intention and employees believed you would actually cut out 64, 62% of, of meetings, then there's a benefit. And then yeah. some people may resist, but others won't. The problem is we don't know what happens with the data and and how's the data going to be used and is the data going to use and going back to the old jack welsh days it's like well you're the lowest 10 percent, so you're going to lose your job yeah i mean you said it there at the start that uh monitoring and tracking has been there from the very start you know in archaic fashion as it were compared to today for sure uh, employers knew when the cars pulled up at the parking lot, okay, uh, our workers have arrived at the factory or wherever, but it's become so sophisticated now. Um, you will know more about this, of course, that um, even truckers are monitored when they pull into the motel at night or, you know, not off or whatever. And I'm reminded to some extent of the ultimate totalitarian state here, China. I mean, they they monitor everything. It's zero COVID in China. And, uh, you know, workers and 
the ordinary population, they're watched closely by Big Brother. I hope we're not going in that direction, Ira. That's what bothers me a little bit here. Well, we're we're way out of touch. I mean, I I just last you know on Tuesday nights I teach an organizational change class, and we we're talking about um, disruption. And technology is moving way faster than individuals can keep up with. And individuals are moving faster than businesses can keep up with. But almost at a linear line, it's almost flat line, is public policy. Yeah. And, and the problem is, is technology has, has just, we're, we're living in an alternate universe, is what te technology allows and what public policy, I won't say permits or when the rules and the regulations were made. So we're, we're not talking the same language. We're, we're basically, we got a manager from the 1980s trying to manage a remote workforce in, in 2000. And, and, and so there's just this disconnect, but it still goes back to trust. I mean, because let, let's take your scenario with, with trucking. So the benefit of, of the monitoring, what should be the benefit of the monitoring is that truckers were no longer driving 18 and 20 hours a day or longer is like you have to stop at 10 hours or 12 hours i don't know what the cutoff is but there was a time is no you cannot do that just like pilots hey they got too many hours so those times that's being monitored and they're trying to enforce it so from a from a public safety from an individual safety uh that makes sense but then it's like, what happens after that? I mean, our, you know, companies don't always play by the rules and, and what are the boundaries set and do we trust people happening? But it's really odd. It is people distrust being monitored like that. But how many people that distrust the monitoring are walking around with an Apple Watch or a Fitbit? Mm. And that data is being collected and that data is being shared with insurance companies. And with healthcare companies, mm. uh, and and but people are are willing to do that because the benefit is is like well I know I only had eight thousand steps today and I should have ten thousand or my heart rate's up, uh, or my respirations are up or I need to move around a little bit. So we're willing to accept monitoring monitoring if there's a benefit to us to it, and we may not even understand who who gets all the data. But there's some benefit that we get from it. The problem with businesses is there it goes back to Big Brother or the authoritarian state. All that we're monitoring every step what happens, but I don't trust that you won't use that against me. Yeah. Like if you're going to use that to compare me to somebody else, and therefore I'm not going to get a raise, I'm not going to get a promotion. Um there's a whole debate going on now with remote and hybrid work. We talk about it on future work all, all the time is that, remote? you know, there's a distrust that if you're working remote, which is why they implement those things, is that you're not, how do we know you're not working? But if I'm working at home and I can be more productive because I don't have a meeting and I get, I get all the work done or maybe exceed that work in six hours, why can't, compared to somebody in the office, why can't I cut off my screen? Why can't I detach? Why can't I get those two hours of the bonus if I met your goal? Yeah. And, but that's not how it gets used. It gets done. Well, you, you, why are we paying you for those other two hours every day? Or why are we paying you on Friday when you got all the work done for four days, but we're paying you Friday anyway? That's because somebody's more effective and more productive. They shouldn't be penalized for it. Yeah. Great point. Um, so you, you, you mentioned what you brought up one word there, boundaries. That, that was interesting. So work from home, work at the office, um, the issue of surrendering our personal freedom because of all these productivity surveillance tools. On the one hand, yeah, we can increase productivity. On the other, we might lose, you know, a certain sense of privacy. You know, some people have a big problem with surveillance being intruding their home work life and the company officials being able to track the movements of the worker at home. Should, should there be limitations there? There's gotta, there's gotta be some transparency. And, and again, I'm gonna go back to trust. 
if there was transparency, if there was a conversation of why we're doing it and and just saying that, oh, trust me, we're going to use this in the right way. We're not going to use this against you is a whole other story because companies, nobody believes that. Uh, but if there's transparency and you can build trust and, and, and possibly work together of what, again, what benefit is there for an employee to be tracked? I mean, if they can, if they can become more productive, if they can, um, if, if the company looks at, at activities that they're required to do that aren't effective, or they look at technology that's not working. You know, why are you, why are you, you know, we noticed that you had 4,000 keystrokes and 2,500 of them were exactly the same, the same pattern. What can we do to help you <laughs> not be yeah. routine? But you're, but is the data being used that way? And I would say no, because even if you look at what's happening in the tech companies now, I mean, I don't want to go off on that, but the tech companies with the layoffs, I mean, everyone has said, whoops, we overplayed how fast we were going to grow. Now, these are the companies that have more data than anybody else in the world. And these are the people that have algorithms for everything. And they blew it on growth. So if if they can't figure out how fast their business is growing, what are they going to do with all this data that they're collecting about individual uh, activities that they have? So just collecting the data, um, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I trust it, but there is a bit of hypocrisy here because the employees, again, they're sitting there with their Apple Watch and their Fitbit on yeah, while yeah. they're and, and complaining about that. It, you know, it goes back to I came from healthcare. And people would come in, they'll come in with their Apple Watch and their Fitbit, which is tracking all these devices, but I don't want to give you my social security number. Yeah. Why why do I because I don't want to, that you're invading my privacy. <clears throat> mm. Well, we've surrendered our privacy because of all the things oh, you've sure. just out, laid out there. The GPS tracking devices and um you know, the special iPhones and so on. Unless you're off the grid, I mean, you really can't disappear. From the planet somebody has your data and that's that's just ultimate hypo hypocrisy think about people who use social media they're using facebook they're using twitter they're using TikTok, and they're concerned about their privacy about being monitored and that's all they do yeah they monitor it they're monitoring every response how long you're on what you type what you like what you don't like in order to give you a better experience. So I'll still go back to the original. People are willing to give up their privacy. They're willing to default to that and they use the technology. What they're not willing to do is give it up and not know and not get a benefit from it. So, you know, you can argue what the benefit from being on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok is, um, but ultimately people are willing to do that if they get something in return. And it could just be fun. It could be a laugh. It could be feel good. It could be an expression yeah. of emotion. Um, but just monitoring it with this, that we're working on productivity, um, that's the problem. So there is no trust. It's, it's amazing. This is very interesting. And um, two out of three firms now in the US and in other countries are, you know, using some kind of tracking technology that's where we're at and since the COVID pandemic as we've discussed um you know the number of companies ratcheting up their surveillance technology has accelerated um you know I, maybe one of the downsides is um the cookie cutter approach of tracking technology for example um there are such things as soft skills, and I use that to explain a situation where you may have a worker who's not at their desk in the cubicle, typing away, processing the insurance claim or whatever, but instead is at the water cooler, exchanging some ideas with another worker, and they have a brainstorm, which could ultimately be very productive, but that could be misunderstood by the boss as slacking off oh well it always has been i mean water cooler water cooler <laughs> talk is there were people that literally consultants that made a living 
from either encouraging you to hang around the water cooler or eliminating the hangout around the water cooler, about too much time spent in the lunchroom. Though the debate of whether it's good or bad or indifferent has been going on for my 40, you know, 40 plus years in business. I've heard those conversations all the time. Even when I had a healthcare practice, there were literally, there were, there were practice consultants that would talk about that why are you know why is everybody hanging out in the lab or why is everybody hanging out in the lunchroom and there were you know dentists and physicians that would get upset with that and there's others that encourage that because it created a relationship that's where the conversations happened mm. um, so yeah it, it it but it's on steroids i mean it, it literally you you said i mean it, it's it's scarier it's faster it's more involved the tools that we're using uh, are much higher, uh, are, are, are much more legitimate at tracking it. Um, it doesn't mean they're good, but they're they're more legitimate. But to think about this and, and put this in the light of employees, there was a study that just came out um, that's almost three out of four managers are looking and to get people back is they're going to make attendance part of the performance review. Attendance at work, R- right? In in wow. in person. In, in person. So we're, you know, how do we get people back? They're not doing it voluntarily. We're going to make attendance part of the performance review. At the same time, a new study that little, that just came out uh, uh, just today what, um, is that it, from the, uh, the state of the remote work stated that almost seven out of 10 employees said that they'll quit before they come back. Uh, and it just, you know, it goes on from there. So there's a complete disconnect from there. Now, if they said, listen, you can work from home, but we're going to track you. And we're going to do a, an evaluation to see, are you more, are you really more productive at home or are you more productive at work? And which activities are you more productive at home? And which activities are you, are we more productive in the workplace? So if, if you, and that's not going to fix everybody's mindset. But if, if the intention was, and there was a trust built up, that we're doing this to ensure that we want you to be able to stay home as many hours and as many days a week as possible, but we've discovered that that we just can't accomplish, we can't just accomplish this particular task or project or teamwork or, or deliverable, whatever it is, without you here. So we are going to require you that you come in for one day a week or two days a week, but the other three days, yeah, you're right. You are more productive at home. And once that's done, you can start turning off some of that equipment, but you have like anything else, if you don't measure it, you don't know. And that's where we are. So the debate over hybrid remote uh, and, and in-person work is going to continue on until we collect, until we monitor people to collect that data, but there's put, so, but then you got, is it legal? Is it not legal? Is what's the yeah. pushback? What, what's the morale like when you do that? But I'm not sure anybody's having that conversation to say, listen, our goal is to see maybe it is more productive that you work from home five days a week. Yeah. And we were wrong, but we can't do that if we don't, if we're not monitoring any of this information and we are all in foreign territory, there is no one that has figured out the blend of is is remote work better, is in-person work better, is hybrid better, what's the what's the variation of that? How many hours, how many days, what works best? Is it does some people work better in the office? Do some people work better at home? Uh, what type of equipment we need? We don't know that. And everybody's just winging it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone making it up as we go along. The plane took off lot three years ago. And, and, you know, people are still trying to figure out how do we keep it in the air? It's still rocky. And nobody's even said, how do we land it? Yeah. Yeah. So we're a long ways off from really knowing, um, you know, where it um, shakes out and the benefits are upsides, downsides. Um, There's at least one company in America, and I spoke to them it's a while ago now, but I'm sure there are multiple companies in the same field this is really freaky science fiction on some level that they can implant a microchip uh, anywhere in your body so that when you come in through you know the the portals or the front office or whatever your boss will know worker abc 
has arrived. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's, you know, and I, I love the science fiction. And, you know, I talk about, you know, we're living in a time where the, the lines between science fiction and reality are blurred. Uh, that's probably pushing what, first of all, I will say that's probably pushing the limits, at least at this point in time. However, um, 20, 30, 40 years from now, I don't know if, you, if, if I'm going to be around to see this or, or, or give you feedback on it. Um, in 20 or 30 years, but the reality is, is that's, that's pushing the limits and, and having, you know, if you want to work for us, we have a, we're going to implant a chip. <laughs> so, so this, this is really interesting, John, because the chip at the one hand, it's like, yeah, I don't want to have a chip in so they can monitor me, but this is really interesting. They are developing a microchip to replace certain organs. Mm. So let's say, um, you have, you're, well, not pancreatic cancer, but let's say you have, your pancreas goes. Let's say your heart goes, okay? You know, right now we need a transplant. So the next best thing we have is 3D printed hearts or 3D printed vessels. So that's some technology, but they're also developing a microchip because all the heart is, is a pump. It's a muscle and it pumps blood. What if it could be controlled by a microchip? that it could pump and and the microchip is embedded into us. Instead of having a heart surgery, instead of having a heart re, uh, transplant, what if our organs can be replaced by a microchip? And most, uh, my guess is most people would go, yeah, I would do that. But then you get that fine line between, okay, you can implant an organ, but you, but that 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 microchip's going to allow monitoring, but you yeah. can't do it at work. Yeah, and, and again, just thinking about that, where our public policy is, where our laws and regulations are, the fact is is that we can't even figure out remote and hybrid work because this is so difficult for a business to employ people in multiple states that cross lines. So we have the technology that anybody can work anywhere. Yeah. But it's so complicated to pay them legally and to set up Nexus and do all those things. So thinking about putting a microchip in somebody is like as a total disconnect. Now, is that going to happen? Yeah, it probably will happen. Yeah. We can't, you can't um, stop the progress and race of technology, but it's moving so fast we can't keep up on the policy making end. But yeah, you know, I can just think of other things. We've drawn technology, um, you know, mapping technology. You know, I get somebody's address, I can see, you know, their home, their garden, front yard, backyard, or apartment or whatever. It's just extraordinary, really. And when you pause to think about it, we haven't realized many of us how far we've come even in the past four or five years. Oh, absolutely. And I'll, but I'll, and I'll go back to something I've been saying since day one, almost day one. I don't know if it hit me on day one of when everybody went home. So from March, middle of March, 2020 is like, what would our world have been if we didn't have the technology? What would have happened to the pandemic? Because everybody was had Zoom fatigue. Everybody was tired of that. But the reality is, if we didn't have the technology that we had, we didn't have the Ubers and we couldn't have the delivery and we didn't have apps that we can order and we didn't have all that, all, all that technology, then our econo we would have had a lot more people unemployed or we would have had been forced that people would have been forced to continue to go to work to deliver yep. these services without safety. We would have had many, many more people that were sick, many more people that would have died. Um, and we were, we had overwhelmed the system as it was. So technology saved us from a greater catastrophe than we had, but because we were just thrown into the mix, no one had time to figure out the rules, regulations, what are the boundaries? How do we establish trust? Now, over time, there's some companies that did a really, really good job at doing that. They, they, they had conversations, they were considerate, 
They they mon they monitored the employees' attitudes of how things were going, and they engaged them. And other people just said, "We don't trust you, so you have to keep your screen on all the time, and we're going to manage your keystrokes." Um, you know, the, that that's Big Brother. That's just I won't even say it's Big Brother. That's just bad management. It's yeah. just bad leadership, bad management. Um, it's it's hey, keep your door open so I can see that you're working. Yeah, yeah. So some some of this stuff is not new either. If you really thought about it, just even during elections and so on, um, you know that slick and sophisticated uh, campaign operatives, you know, can use a lot of polling data and data available online to sort of micromanage campaigns. So we see where all of that is. I mean, I, th I think a lot of it's about striking a fine balance and that our privacy is not interrupted and invaded in a way that is unacceptable. And um, we certainly don't want, um, as some analyst calls it, surveillance paranoia. We don't want that kind of a thing. And we don't want a China style police state either. Yeah, I, I'll go back. I've said this a few times, trust and boundaries. And the boundaries get wider, the more trust you have. So if the consideration is that I feel that you're invading my privacy, that may be true, but we already recognize that people are willing to give up. They're, they're willing to open the boundary up or extend the boundary if they get something in return. And therefore, it's I don't trust that you're going to use it properly or I don't trust that I'm going to get any benefit. This is all for you, the employer. The employees have to get some benefit from being monitored. On that note, Ira Wolf, thank you for being on my show. And we'll have you back next week for our regular segment of Future Shock 2.0.